Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes okay. Um, I'm Paul Sokoloff, the president of the Prince Society. And on behalf of the Prince Society and the Department of South and Southeast Asian Art here at the Nelson, I'd like to knock off this water. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for taking time this afternoon. Um, we're incredibly excited and pleased to be able to have um, artist Ambreen Butt here with us this afternoon to talk about her work and the print that she did for the Print Society. For those of you who are not familiar with the Print Society, it is comprised of members of the museum who not only have a general love of art, but have a particular passion for works on paper and fine art prints. Um, we have two basic uh, aspects of our mission. One is to support the collection, the print collection of the Nelson Atkin, Atkins by, by purchasing and gifting prints to the museum and also to provide you know, educational and social programs uh, for our members in the community at large. You know, we have a monthly schedule which you can follow um, either in the publications of the museum or on our Facebook page or blog. Uh, we have a new uh, rack card out there with our information that you're welcome to take. Um, I just want to spend a second of talking about the commission print. Um, in the history of the Print Society, I believe um, that this is the 37th commission print that the Print Society has, has done. Um, and it serves several purposes. One, it allows us to uh, provide a significant print to the collection of the museum. It allows our members and others to add those prints to their collections. And it is the primary way in which the Print Society raises funds in order to fulfill our mission by being able to purchase and gift prints to the collection here. Um, we have a table outside, and if you haven't taken time to look more closely at this beautiful print, um, pl please do. It, it's available at a special program-only day discount, but it will be continue to be available through the museum bookstore on an ongoing basis. Um, I'd like to introduce now Kim Masteler, who's the curator of South and Southeast Asian art here at the museum, who will tell you something about uh, our speaker today. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the Prince Society for commissioning this wonderful print that it's outside. And if you haven't looked at it carefully yet, closely, you must do that after the talk. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. This is one in a series of some very special events this year focused on South Asia at the Nelson Atkins. We just celebrated Diwali a few weeks ago with a happy hour. I'm still recovering from that one. And we're looking forward to Passport to India, which is our annual family cultural celebration, which will be on April 9th. Uh, in fact, the year of 2017, we are commemorating 78 years of South Asian independence. And uh, to help with this, we're hosting a fundraiser called Silver for the 70th. Here's the little flyer you might see outside. Um, and this is to help the museum acquire works of art and uh, support programming uh, in the following year for um, commemorating this anniversary. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, uh, feel free to ask me after the talk. We are also offering a lecture on January 26, focused on masterworks in the Indian and Southeast Asian collections in celebration of our new book, which just came out on the collections. <laughs> just arrived a few weeks ago uh, and is for, available for purchase uh, at the bookstore. But you're not here to listen to me or hear about our special opportunities. Uh, you're here to listen to her. So let me tell you about our special guest today. Ambreen Butt was born in Lahore, Pakistan. She received her BFA in traditional Persian and Indian miniature painting from the National College of Arts in Lahore which is a very famous program and has now produced some very famous artists. And in fact, I would say the 
best known miniaturists internationally who've come from this program are Imreen, Imran Qureshi, and Shazia Sikander. And you all were pretty close in school, weren't you? Um, Umbreen moved to Boston in 1993 and attended the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, earning an MFA in painting in 1997. In fact, she called Boston her home until this year. Umbreen was very active in the Boston art scene, which is where I got to know her work uh, many years ago. Umbreen's work has earned her many honors and much recognition. She's the recipient of awards from foundations such as the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the Canada Council for the Arts, and the James and Audrey Foster Prize at the Institute of Contemporary Art, the ICA in Boston. And she was also appointed as an artist in residence at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Moreover, she and her works have been featured in the New York Times, Art in America, Art News, Art Forum, Art Asia Pacific, you've got them all, um, and on NPR and PBS. Ambreen has an equally impressive exhibition and collections history. Her work has been featured in many solo and group exhibitions, both nationally at institutions like the MFA and ICA in Boston, the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, the Brooklyn Museum, and internationally it, with shows in Germany, Beijing, and at the National Art Gallery in Islamabad. Her works are in the permanent collections of the MFA, ICA, and de Cordova Museums in Boston, the Hood Museum at Dartmouth, the Brooklyn Museum, and now I am proud to say, thanks to the help of the Prince Society, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. So thank you again. She comes to us today from Dallas, where she is a resident now of the great state of Texas, and she is busy setting up her studio. She'll talk with us today about her work, from miniature paintings to her exquisite printmaking and her newly installed wall mural in the American Embassy in Islamabad in Pakistan, and wait till you hear about this project. I think you'll find Umbreen as fascinating and thought-provoking as her exquisite artworks. After her talk, we'll have a few minutes to take questions. And uh, without taking any more time from Umbreen, pre please help me welcome this wonderful artist, Ms. Umbreen Butt. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very humbled and honored to be here uh, to speak about my work. Uh, and I thank you all for taking the time out on Saturday afternoon to come hear me speak. So um, I guess, um, as uh, Kim mentioned about my earlier uh, training as a miniaturist back in Pakistan, I'd like to add a little uh, that um, it is, before I start showing my work, it's very important to uh, have a little basic understanding of the process of making a miniature painting as uh, it has uh, been mainly a seed for most of the work that I've cultivated to this date. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and give you a little introduction of how the miniature painting is done before I move on to the slides. So um, first, what is, a, what is it that makes a miniature painting so distinct from the rest of the paintings? Is uh, it's um, a small size, of course, and um, it's, a, it's um, the redundant mark making and um, the process of layering, um, which is very, very meditative. And, um, and then there is a paper, this is, which is the surface uh, that um, is used, that was used by the old masters. Uh, the paper is made uh, uh, with very fine cotton and silk and uh, it's called wasli. The word wasli has come out of a Persian word 
the wassail, which means to meet. Uh, in uh, the literary world, uh, the, the word wassail has been used oftentimes to describe the union or the meeting of two lovers. Uh, so the making of the paper actually gives it a name, Wesley. So how the old masters used to make this paper was that they used to uh, take very fine cotton or very fine silk, and they would glue it uh, several layers of these uh, the sheets together. Uh, so the meeting of the layers of the paper give, gives it an, uh, uh, the name Wesley. And, uh, and I have always been very fascinated with the process, you know, the ritualistic process of, uh, 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 of this genre. And that had carried on in my work. Uh, and you will see how I have explored and evolved from, from that process in my work. Uh, then there comes um, uh, the brushes. They're also made by hand uh, from a squirrel's fur. You take a very fine um, uh, hair from the tail part of the squirrel. And then you tie them and you put them in uh, the pigeon shaft, and then you take a bamboo and sharpen it, uh, and put stick it at the back of the the pigeon shaft so that you know it makes a nice holder. So here you have a very very fine brush that um, uh, you know needs a very smooth surface to run on because it can barely hold any uh, ink in it. Uh, once the paper, you know, all these layers are dried, uh, the artist would take a very fine um, a smooth a stone or a glass, we used to use conch shells to burnish the surface. And it is burnished many times, you know, from top to bottom, from right to left, and then, you know, on and on, until all the fiber is pressed down and uh, we have a very, very smooth and slippery surface for a very fine brush to run on. And then there goes the painting process, which is also goes through several layers. First, there's a, a line drawing, then the colors are added, and then uh, the painting goes through, uh, um, you know, a layering process, you know, through a very meditative uh, mark making, uh, which is called perdacht. And it's a very particular mark that you make. You know, your, the movement of your hand goes from uh, right to left, generally, uh, and, uh, you know, gently your brush touches the surface. It sort of kisses the surface and lifts it off. And just imagine that it's happening in a very continuous, uh, redundant motion. Uh, it's very, very, um, uh, yeah, it's very meditative. So, um, and then um, once the miniature is done, it's, uh, you know, you can see the meticulous process, but you don't really see the underneath layers that it has gone through. And that has always fascinated me, the time that has been spent because it, could take you a whole month to finish one painting, depending on where you at, are at in the process of learning. So as part of the, um, so as a miniaturist under training, uh, I was supposed to, to look at old master's paintings, drawings, and copy them. And this has been the hardest thing uh, I could tell you. I have been practicing art for several decades now, and uh, it's easy to make your own art than to look at the old masters and copy it. Uh, this is not the way I had learned in America how to paint, but there are some classical ways of learning how to paint, so this was one of them. Uh, we were very restric restricted. Uh, it's a very highly structured and uh, disciplined uh, uh, format uh, where you look at the old masters painting and try to make the color and uh, to learn the technique, you follow the marks. Um, so of all the resources that I had back in Pakistan, you know, we didn't have much uh, miniatures available to look at. Um, um, I found myself more and more interested in uh, the female figure. Um, they have been part of my work since then. Um, most of these figures were from the older paintings I found very beautiful, seductive, and yet submissive. So this is one of the example of the older uh, painting uh, I could show you, which is from the 17th century uh, Mughal miniature. Um, I had always wondered uh, what it would be like for, if, for this uh, figure or this woman to have been evolved throughout centuries, because unfortunately, uh, after the fall of Mughal Empire, um, 
uh, this uh, traditional um, uh, technique or this traditional genre didn't line through. And uh, there were only artists who were left who uh, were carry on, carrying on this tradition was to by looking at old masters painting and copying, the, copying them. So, uh, uh, okay. So my interest was in, in the figure, in the process of layering, in the figure, and just imagining what it would be like if she had lined through uh, this time when it didn't evolve, what would she look like? Would she still be beautiful and seductive and uh, uh, submissive or uh, something else? So in order to see that, I had to bring her into my work. So these I called uh, as my studies uh, because as part of, as I mentioned, um, uh, as part of my training, I was supposed to look at old masters. Um, the only liberty I had in working on these was to put a bunch of elements together from different paintings. So the figures have been taking, taken from uh, some two different masters. The one on your... Uh, left is the, actually the first painting I started painting on. And the reason that I brought here, uh, brought it here for you to look at that anyone can make a miniature painting. It just requires a lot of commitment of time and patience. So it took me a whole month. Uh, I think I could do it in a short amount of time now, now that my hand and my whole body is aligned with the mark making and, and the process. Uh, but back then it took me a whole month. Uh, and the, uh, so the figure was taken from a late Mughal painting. The other one, uh, they're both two different techniques. Um, the other one's a Persian. Uh, it's, this technique is called gadrang, which is uh, watercolors with white gouache. The other one is um, uh, a neem rang with uh, just the uh, watercolors. Uh, and the painting has been built through small mark, marks. So, the only time after you know, the several years of learning the techniques and you've mastered the techniques, then you could actually explore in your thesis project. You could actually do whatever you, in terms of your content, but you still have to stay within the, the format, the structure of the technique. So we were supposed to use the technique, make the wasli, make the brushes, use the pi pigments, and the figures have to be styled. You know, so this is one of the characteristics of miniature painting, that it often has these uh, very uh, stylized uh, uh, figures which are very uh, narrative-based. And um, so, um, so when the time came, uh, I was able to develop my own style of making the figures, which was constantly evolving with time. Uh, this work was in response to an incident in which a housemaid was exploited and deceived by a male member of an elite family. I used the Kangra style paintings of Krishna and Radha, a painting that you saw previously, uh, as a platform to build my own space and narrative. The cluster of female figures inspired by the uh, disciple gopis are seen here almost like little sperms. While the content of this painting was highly disturbing, I tried to bring the, bring the element of seduction and beauty into the work, which is an eminent characteristic of miniature painting. Uh, one of the reasons that I decided uh, to um, choose um, a miniature painting as my major uh, uh, focus was, uh, you know, that I was completely mesmerized by the, by the beauty. You know, they literally seduced me. I will not, uh, you know, try to put any intellectual that, you know, that they, you know, they, they did, you know, drew me intellectually as well. But that was my first response was that, you know, the beauty was it. And I, you know, can easily uh, admit that then, you know, I was seduced by them. And that's why I chose them, uh, chose it to be as my major uh, major subject. So, um, um, so we, are, as artists, uh, I must say that we live in two disparate worlds. Uh, one world is very, um, it's it's very beautiful. It's the world of idealism and imagination. It has no boundaries, and you can you're free to do anything. And then there's another world that we share with the rest of the world. Um, there's a lot happens in that world, you know. Uh, there, there are some beautiful things, a lot of beautiful things, and yet there are some, you know, um, 
ugly things as well that happens. And so, so our challenge as an artist is to, uh, or specifically for me, it has been to reconcile these two worlds. And my artworks becomes the place where you know this reconciliation happens. And um, so, whenever I see a lot of injustices and oppression and inequalities, you know, it it keeps showing up in my work. Uh, so. I may or may not offend some of you while I'm going through my work because of the content, but uh, uh, you won't be disappointed with the execution of the work. Um, the next one, this piece was made in 1995 uh, after I had just moved to the uh, after I had moved to the United States. Uh, up until at this point, I have been exploring the role of a female figure in my work, and. I yet have not defined her fully. I did not know who she was and what her role is in the work. So sometimes I would uh, appropriate it from uh, old masters. So this figure has been appropriated from a tantric uh, painting and put, uh, and I've put her into a, a, diff a newer context to give new meanings to the work. Um, here you will see her, uh, her, uh, her uh, you know, she is seen here naked with her ornaments on, her gesture with dropped hands suggests her vulnerability. Her feet are buried in the layers of text and she's unable to cross these boundaries that surrounds her. There is a battle going on behind her, almost like her own battle with her multiple hands, trying to sever the snakes of her. Of her. She could be any woman from today's time and yet she seemed from a very different world. So while I'm working on defining her identity, I'm also exploring the way the painting is built. My process is still the same um, as of a miniature painting. You know, this is still going through several layers uh, of paint, but instead of burying those layers, uh, with these meticulous mark, I started using text as uh, as one layer and image the other. So I would do the image and then put a layer of text on top of it, and then put uh, uh, draw an image and then put a layer of text on top of it. So you can actually see those uh, uh, you know the reminiscent of the the uh, the time that has been spent in there and and all these layers in the background. Uh, this was a body of work. Uh, the title of this uh, series was called um, Bed of My Own Making. Um, and talking about the process, uh, you know, as I explained to you earlier about how the Wesley is made, uh, as also responding to the materials around me. Uh, so I wanted to make a Wesley, but I still wanted to be able to see the layers underneath, you know, uh, the time of myself, which is a very intimate time that you spend because you're sitting on the floor for several hours and you're holding your painting on your lap and this is how we work. It's a very, very personal, intimate experience. So um, uh, so I uh, picked a, a paper which was transparent and which was a very modern material. It was a pet film which is called Mylar. I, star I started drawing on Mylar uh, and then instead of gluing it together, I stitched it together with a thread. And then the imagery goes on, on top. So in this series, I brought uh, only two pieces from the series. Um, uh, I'm also uh, evolving this, uh, this female in my work. Uh, you know, in the earlier work, as you saw, you know, she looked very mythical. And I wanted her to to belong someplace, and I wanted her to look like she was from uh, the present time, the times that I was living in. So, so I started modeling myself. Uh, I would model, and then I would stylize the figure from there, and then you know that's how the imagery is created. Uh, this whole series was about. Uh, you can see that in this particular piece, you know, where the woman is standing on a fish, and uh, her long hairs turn into a fishing uh, loop, and. So she is kind of perform, you know, in a sort of a ritualistic performance where the viewer is just a viewer and she is performing some sort of an act. And we don't know as a viewer, what is she going to do? Is she going to pull her loop and what will happen? Will she fall 
or she's going to stay in, in that limbo that she seems. So the whole series was about making decisions and, and, and sticking with them for good or for worse. Um, Uh, this was uh, the last of the same series. I just brought the first and the last to show you, and still uh, done on Mylar. And here she is seen uh, chopping off her own hair, uh, which kind of symbolizes, you know, moving on, uh, or, you know. As I was, uh, you know, evolving, you know, as she was evolving in my work, um, uh, you know, the things happen around in the other world, which we share with the rest of us. Um, this series was called I Must Utter What Comes to My Lips. The title's been taken from um, uh, 14th century uh, Punjabi poet Bulle Shah and uh, his poetry. And um, uh, this, the work is a response uh, to, um, this was made in response to the um, uh, the events of September 11th and uh, their effect on individuals' lives. So here uh, it's a diptych, and I went back. You know, I was exploring a lot after working on word, on paper, uh, on different materials. I went back and made uh, the traditional wasli, and uh, uh, because my focus was only to uh, on the narrative and on uh, evolving the figure. So here she becomes the vehicle for the for the viewer to enter into the landscape of the painting, which becomes the place of a survival uh, uh, and defense and escape. And, um, and as you can see, uh, this was a diptych. Uh, she is seen in one of them, um, uh, the, the, her hair, which is turned into a tree, which is the world she's created for herself that, uh, that she's clinging on. And uh, then there's another outer force that is trying to lift her up. And in the second one, she's uh, uh, lost her grip, and she's been lifted up. Um, and so in traditional ministers also, uh, you know, the, there are certain uh, characteristics. Uh, there's one uh, characteristic that I've also noticed that was often there was this, this like, subtle symbolism. And, uh, and yet there's childlike clarity in them. And I, I like that quality in the work. You know, I, so I wanted to. Uh, Extract it and you know start using that characteristic in my own work. So you could see this, you know, like with the colors of her clothes and a little bit of symbolism here and there. You know, it's very uh, obvious and yet you know uh, it's kind of um, hidden too. Um, this is another painting. Um, uh, this is done with, um, it's small. This is, it's actually on view uh, in Philadelphia, the Asia uh, Art Initiative exhibition called I Bear Witness, uh, along with other artists. Uh, this is done all, so the background's all done with uh, tea and coffee with small marks. And, um, uh, and here, you know, it is seen, you know, you, you can see the clash of different versions of fanaticism, which is resulting in, in a, a collateral damage. And so they're both back to back with their guns, blindfolded back to back with their guns. And uh, the result of their action, you know, you can see it's this uh, just one uh, innocent bird falling from the sky. Okay. Um, one of the other, uh, I think, uh, thing that has resulted from the, uh, you know, post 911 or the 911 uh, 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 tragedy was the uh, the homeland security, and I've had many friends and uh, and people that have heard like close uh, stories from uh, close uh, fa uh, friends and family members, you know, like. Uh, what they had to go through because of the the homeland security, um, um, you know. Th so this painting actually came about after hearing, you know, this was a response to those stories. Uh, um, I don't know if there's much I could say about that. It explains to its, you know, by itself. Um, if you ever wonder what it is like to be a Muslim in the post-91 world in America, I would say look at this painting because it's almost like walking on a tightrope. 
The background is hand, it's, these are all hand marbled, and then they've been turned into a, a wesley. There was one more. Um, uh, this was a response to, uh, as you can see from uh, different colors, uh, how they're blending with each other, the greens and the blues. You know, they kind of remind you a little bit of certain kind of flags and, you know, like how they're combined and blending and turning into a different new entity. This painting was a response to uh, the, the war on terror and, um, and how this separate, you know, different entities were, you know, joining in uh, for one mission to uh, eradicate or eliminate the infrastructure of what we call terrorism. Um, miniature paintings were always, they were made uh, to be part of manuscripts. They were, that's why they were always small in size. And they were very limited to a certain kind of only, uh, to certain kind of audiences. Uh, general public could not have an access to them uh, because they were part of the books. And, uh, and uh, you know, I had also contemplated this whole idea of, you know, the book and the page and the narrative and how, uh, you know, and for what does it mean for us or for me as a miniature artist uh, or uh, to be working or get gaining inspiration from that uh, in today's time and be viewing it in today's time and uh, and how you know it could evolve from a book into a larger space which is what it is like uh, or all about nowadays walking into a museum space or a gallery space and looking at art on the walls. So what I did was I uh, and, and uh, you know the paintings are often uh, gripped by very elaborate, beautiful borders. And between the border and the painting, there's always these very fine lines, colorful lines, which are called the Hashia lines, uh, uh, the border lines. Uh, and they always fascinated me because they, these are the lines that are pushing the, the space outside and then also bringing the border space, you know, joining it with the, so they are the, the joint and they are the separator at the same time. So what I, what I did in my work uh, in this show at the Worcester Art Museum, uh, 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 I must utter what comes to my lips in 2013, I think it was, uh, that I brought those lines outside of, uh, from the frames of the painting and brought them out on the wall. So that each wall becomes a page and the narrative moves from one wall to the other. So it's as if you are walking in, inside the book, you know, uh, um, And these are some of the other pieces from the same uh, series and uh, sh uh, show. Um, I, must I must utter what comes to my lips, uh, kind of reflecting upon other human nature and how at times and how weird we are, like, you know, we change in our stance and the moods depending on what we are surrounded by. And one you'll see, she's blowing this, uh, you know, uh, the air of love, and the other one, she's become part of the system and, you know, uh, getting along with it and seem very aloof. The, uh, and sometimes, you know, she's standing up and, you know, taking a stand and telling to stop. And the other times, you know, she's beaten and surrounded by the darkness around her. Um, that's a triptych, and that's at uh, the collection of Davis Art Museum. Uh, uh, this one is all about trust, deception, and betrayal. So the narrative moves from um, uh, from your left to the right. Uh, she's seen, uh, you know, the birds, birds have been fed, and then you know, she's carrying a burden in her around on her back, and then you know, that has become her secure space which, which she, she stands on. And then the, and the third one, uh, she is ambushed by the, the same birds that she uh, uh, had nurtured earlier. This was another series called What is Past or Passing or to Come? Uh, this uh, was done in uh, 2013 again. Uh, this was a show at uh, then Bernard Toll Gallery, uh, right after my show at the Worcester Art Museum. Uh, most of these uh, paintings, 
are done on multiple layers of mylar. And here you can also see those layers because the way these layers have been placed. Uh, this work can be seen in um, the context of gender power struggle. And, uh, and, and you can see how the, the female figures slowly uh, evolving or growing from like a very shy, beautiful, you know, uh, submissive to, you know, every day becoming stronger. Uh, uh. Um, so this is an installation shot of the series and with the wall piece and that's a detail. So here, uh, you know, the metaphors have been used and uh, you can see the, the, dom the nom domination question is uh, basically unresolved. You can't really, uh, no, sorry, not this one, the, re the next one. Here she's a seductress, you know, she's the, she's the beautiful, uh, you know, I've extracted that characteristic, you know, I wanted her to be beautiful and seducing the viewer. And, uh, and so here she's the seductress. And the other one, uh, where we don't know uh, who is in control here, really. Um, um, here she seems, uh, she's literally lost track of what she's trying to control. Um, and she is indulged in the process of gaining control, but she's also lost track of what she's trying to control. This was another wall where the set of these three paintings uh, were, which were done all uh, with small dots, like, a, like in a very pointillist manner. Uh, so the space that has been created, it's created through these small dots. Um, and then they're stitched together. You can actually even see, can you see the stitching here? Yeah. Um, so here, uh, she is uh, being dragged. Uh, she seems like she wants to be dragged, and yet she wants to resist it. And um, so in this tug of war that is happening, um, something's got to break. So, so the power struggle never really ends cleanly. Basically, this is what you can make out of this painting. Uh, but there's a lot of process, you know, not only the, con you know, uh, some of the pieces that I'm showing you, uh, some have uh, a very personal content, so I may not elaborate, and some have very highly political. Uh, so um, I'm sure you could connect with them at some level, but there's a lot of process, and it's very, very similar to how I have made paint, uh, miniature paintings uh, uh, when I had made them. Uh, they're all done in layers. They're like multiple layers of these mylar. Each layer has been meticulously done. Uh, with small marks, small dots, and then they've been placed together to create this landscape uh, or, or this uh, space. So, you, so in a way, I'm creating this space by using only two-dimensional elements. Another one. Uh, this and the next one, they are uh, actually a diptych. So uh, you can see uh, her, you know, these are like two stages of emancipation. I, you know, you can see them in that manner where she's curled up in a fetal position and the other one, she's opening up and literally taking or flying everywhere. Uh, these are done differently. These are on handmade paper with, uh, with watercolors. Um, and white gouache. So, uh, so I've often thought about the female heroine, the Naika, uh, and how she was imagined and created by the male artist of Indian subcontinent centuries ago. Uh, she was a man's notion of a woman, very quiet, passive, and not challenging. Then I've also thought about the male heroes of the miniature painting, heroes like Amir Hamza, uh, for instance, this is one of the older, uh, from one of the old uh, manuscripts uh, uh, from Akbarnama, right? Uh, so uh, Hamza was actually, he was the uncle of Prophet Muhammad, and he was a very strong man. Um, 
and he had protected his nephew uh, uh, throughout his life. Uh, uh, and his character has been fantasized a lot by the Persian artists. And so he is seen uh, in these beautiful manuscripts fighting the demons and uh, you know the devils and the e demons with uh, in all in the name of right or in the name of Islam, uh, and I, it is uh, I have always been fascinated by you know how he's been portrayed, and and then there are some other legendary heroes like in, uh, in the Persian tr tradition which like Rustam and Sohrab. Uh, so there has always been these male heroes in the traditional Manishu painting, but I really never found a female heroine uh, or female hero in uh, that genre. And I just thought you know, it's very important to have one. <laughs> so, uh, so I created this series called I Need a Hero, uh, where um, she um, is not a fictionalized character. Uh, she, you know, is an inspiration from my other, the real world. Uh, one of the women that, uh, you know, not that in older times that these uh, strong characters didn't exist, but they didn't have representation because uh, they were all, you know, the females were all represented by the male artists. So I wanted to create somebody in my work through the gaze of a female artist. Uh, so this character, uh, uh, Mukhtara Mai, uh, was her name. Uh, she, um, a village woman who uh, actually stood up to her rapists and brought them to, uh, to the court. And, uh, you know, so she actually became a, a big inspiration for me to actually have created this, you know, female heroine in my work. Um, just to, to give you a little background so that you know you know where the work is coming from because it's important uh, the, this woman uh, village woman who did not go to school uh, she was uh, gang raped by uh, uh, at at the um, at the order of a local council uh, for the as part of her punishment for her 11 year old brother alleged crime for having an affair for, uh, with a woman from a higher caste. So, uh, but in what happens, and then this is one of the ills of the societies that, you know, that all grab my uh, attention and what I like to do in my work is take those broken pieces from the society and uh, process them and, and try to turn them into something that is more beautiful. Uh, so, so what, ha what happens in these situations is uh, in, uh, in this rape culture is that the, the woman's life is basically over. Uh, they cannot get married. They, um, they either, you know, they commit suicide or they're basically done for life uh, with the stigma attached to, to them. And uh, so Mai really kind of fought that uh, and she uh, got a lot of help from uh, a, 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 cler a local cleric and uh, she was supported by uh, the rights group. And her story became uh, kind of very known uh, worldwide. And um, so this series, I Need a Hero, is kind of, you know, she became the inspiration. And, you know, uh, you can see that they're all done on Wesley, and uh, where now she's becoming stronger and stronger. And uh, she's the one who's fighting the demons. And here, um, uh, you know, in the one on the left, uh, which was the first one of the series, uh, where you can she seen attacked by these dogs and and then they're uh, you know uh, she's kind of rising from the mouth of a dragon with the sword in her hand so it is going to be only her who's going to come out and to fight for herself nobody else could be her savior it is going to be only herself who will have to play as a hero to be her own savior so. Um, and the second one, you could see that uh, you know, even with her torn clothes, uh, have turned into some sort of a trap uh, for the dogs. And then, uh, um, then she's fighting the demon that she's also s stepping on. Um, this was another triptych. Uh, that was the narrative starts from the left. It goes from left to the right. Uh, this piece was part of uh, a major exhibition uh, for, at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, it's called the Global Feminism, and um, uh, here in one of them, she's you know you can see she's trapped, 
the background's done with uh, gold leaf uh, and watercolors, and uh, and then slowly you move the narrative. The the dragon uh, symbolizes the corrupt system, you know that she's there to fight, and uh, and at the end, you know, you see her. She's she gets it uh, at the tip of her sword. Um, so there's also uh, uh, it's very interesting. I was reading uh, Mai's uh, autobiography and uh, Nicholas Kristof uh, from New York Times, who actually brought her story out uh, to public. You know, he wrote about her in New York Times, and that's how people got to know about it. And they started donating a lot of money and so uh, to her for her foundation. Now and then she had set up a, a nonprofit foundation where she, uh, you know, basically helps women, boys and girls both. And she set up schools, and, and the money goes for edu educating boys and girls. Um, but it was a very interesting thing that I read in the book that it said uh, Mai's life is not, uh, you know, her own anymore. So what happens is that, you know, she doesn't have really power in her hands. She's just a woman. She's a survivor. Uh, uh, and what happens is she's become like a role model for a lot of women who've gone through these go through these domestic abuse and, you know, who've been uh, uh, assaulted and raped. And they travel from all over Pakistan, and they go to her village, and they go to her and ask her for help because they think she can save their lives. And so he was mentioning that she's never alone. She's always, like, in her, you know, you go to her house, and it's a house full of women. And she says, I cannot help anyone. Uh, I'm just there. If they come to me, I can just tell them, come and stay here. So even she's sleeping, she's sleeping with these all these women in her room. Uh, and uh, that was a very interesting for me to see like how, you know, you know, as a woman, th this woman in my work who's evolved from a very shy and a small little sperm, from a small little sperm into this uh, strong uh, fighter, warrior, she is also carrying this burden on herself like as, uh, much as she's becoming depend in, independent, she's also, you know, there's a lot of eyes that are looking up at her uh, in um, uh, expectations. So she's carrying this burden over herself of expectations, uh, and her life is not hers anymore. Um, I, when since I'd moved to the United States, I uh, didn't really. Uh, had much chance to go back to Pakistan, uh, and the first visit I prayed uh, was uh, after 12 years, and that was a long gap. And this a lot had happened in Pakistan. I, you know, we could hear it in the news or from our relatives and family members um, that you know the country has gone through a lot of uh, you know there's been a lot of rise in uh, violence, uh, uh, you know, uh, big political changes. And so when I was there last time, I had uh, witnessed, you know, the chaos uh, that was happening. Uh, the then president, uh, uh, General Pervez Musharraf, uh, w you know, he held the, the, the two most important positions at once. He was uh, the president of the country, and, and he's also the chief of the, the, the army, and uh, which was challenged by the, uh, you know, the lawyers and the, and the, the chief justice, and he had when I was there, he was recently fired uh, because they had challenged, you know, his positions, uh, and you know, there's, there's a lot of like uh, protests going on. There was a the state of emergency. People were put into jail, and you know, people were goaded into police vans. And so when I came back, you know, I'm watching all this, and I said, you know, it, obviously it hurts you. It's it's your motherland, and you know, it's not like what it was when you were there. So. You know, I'm collecting and I'm going through these images, and you know, this is one of the walls of my studio. You know, that I was living through every day, seeing uh, these um, uh, these pictures, and then I started processing them into my work. Uh, so what came out of that was uh, the series called uh, Dirty Pretty, and it was 2008, uh, where I would take these images from the mass media. And then I would combine them with some historical images uh, and uh, and create a, a new uh, narrative, you know, with new meanings into the work. This is an older painting. Uh, it's called the Great Hunt, uh, where uh, the the 
the Emperor Akbar has been seen uh, hunting. Uh, this was one of his uh, favorite activity that you know they he would have uh, a lot of um, uh, you know like his men would capture all these like. Uh, you know, cheetahs or uh, leopards, you know, when they're little babies and they will train them to hunt. So he would take them with him to for hunting and then these animals would be let loose to hunt the gazelles or the deers or whatever they're hunting. Uh, and, and they would be in thousands in number. Uh, so this was like very famous. This was, um, I'm not sure which exactly which place, but it was it, it close proximity, you know, in terms of the, 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 of the land where I come from. And uh, so this scene, you can see it's, it's, it's an incredibly beautiful painting. And you go into the details, you see how these, uh, you know, um, the gazelles were like attacked and, you know, their frightening expressions, you know, they, they have tears in their eyes, you know, the, the tears are flowing in the air. And uh, so it is heard that, uh, it is said that it, this whole event, there was so much bloodshed in that field that it had also changed Akbar's uh, life too. You know, he became a very peaceful person afterwards. Uh, and um, he created his own uh, kind of sort of like a cult or religion it's called uh, Dine Ilahi or something like that. We would encourage people from different uh, backgrounds, different faiths. Um, so I wanted to bring that, uh, paint, show you the picture so that you could understand the piece that I created. Uh, it's a diptych, and this is fairly large in size. Uh, it's almost like six feet. Uh, these are all done on multiple layers of mylar, and then they are stitched on a tea-stained paper. Each layer has been worked upon. It's been stitched. There are a lot of drawings that has been stitched, so I actually pierce into the plastic mylar with uh, the thread and the drawings, uh, you know, I can show you some details later on. Uh, and then uh, the images of these mass media, they, you know, uh, it's been juxtaposed by the, the Great Hunt. And so the painting is called Great Hunt. It's actually Great Hunt 2. This was the one that I made sec second. Uh, I'll show you the first one after this. Uh, we can go to the details. This is one of the panels on the left. So the format is very uh, familiar. It's like you know an open page of a book. So when you see a format like that, if uh, the painting part is closer to the right, that means it's the left side of the page. And if the painting is on the, on, on closer to the left, it's the right side of the page. Um, uh, so they go side by side on the wall. So it's one of the details. And it's uh, uh, actually incredibly challenging to work on a surface like that uh, uh, because it's, it's plastic, it won't hold anything. So I kind of uh, uh, invented a technique to use my watercolors on top of mylar. Um, these are stitched, uh, this drawing uh, is stitched. And then uh, the real gold uh, leaf has been used uh, with all these ornaments, uh, you see. This is the, the Great Hunt one, and um, this is the underneath, uh, the under layers. You know, I was, thankfully I found a picture, so I thought I, I can show you what it looks like uh, when it's in the process. So the, each work has been worked upon different. I cut through it, I draw on it, I stitch on it, and then it's put together. Uh, That's the actual, uh, the final uh, piece. The center, sort of like this medallion, that's the mylar piece, and then it's on the tea stained paper. It's one of the details. These are the, my resources. And that's how the stitching happens. So every process I've done so far, it's tedious. It's very similar to how I was trained. Uh, there's no easy way out for me <laughs> in making art. Um, that's another painting from the same series, Dirty Pretty. The protesters.
I found uh, these uh, images are very disturbing, but I also find them incredibly beautiful um, because of the women. You know, they are powerful, strong, and beautiful at the same time. Uh, this is a view of uh, uh, the exhibition uh, from the, I was an artist in residence at the Dartmouth College uh, in uh, two, 2009, I think. Uh, yeah, 2010, 2010, yeah. And it had a very peculiar you know, space. Um, and so this is the view of the, uh, the exhibition. The sh show was called Dirty Pretty and Other stories, I think. Uh, this is the view of the exhibition through my installation. Uh, this is one of the earlier installations that I'd done with the same materials uh, and how they were interacting was, you know, instead of doing the stitching, stitching the mylar, they actually uh, have been, uh, you know, the, I'm using the thread um, and it's, um, tied to the ceiling and then it comes down to the floor and the mylars kind of turn, you know, the drawing of the mylars turn into a box and then the kind of box is hanging in the middle and there are these layers and layers of these strings uh, that are tied. Um, I brought this image to show you um, uh, in the next uh, set of series uh, and um, Uh, this is a series. It's uh, these are all prints. It's these are etchings, and uh, it's it, the suite is called um, uh, Daughters of the East, and um, it's about uh, um, it's about infestation, and it's uh, um, it's about uh, vulnerability at the same time. Um, uh, so when you see this image that I showed you earlier, this is an image from uh, a madrasa in uh, in Islamabad. Uh, these women, uh, you know, they're all covered. You know, they're, you cannot identify them who they are. Their identity is not revealed. They are holding these bamboo sticks in their hands and protesting against something. Uh, and uh, what we don't know is that uh, these uh, mostly these are. Uh, uh, little young girls, like uh, from the age between 15 to 18 to 21, uh, and they have been uh, kind of, you know, brainwashed at, uh, at the school that uh, they were, um, the, at, at this madrasa, where, you know, and they belong to uh, some uh, very uh, modest families who would send their girls for religious education, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, that Madrasa had some political inclination and started training them for something else. So, uh, so they, you, you know, you don't know uh, who they are and uh, until, so, you know, so, so it's, the image is very, I just saw, it, it's looked very threatening because for, an, for a Westerner or for an outsider, uh, if you see a woman in burqa, and generally you assume that she's oppressed and she, you know, uh, by men or by her family through religion, and uh, and uh, uh, so you know, so, so, so she's a victim. Uh, but then when they're together like that, you know, it's, it it was quite a shocking image for me also just to see with their they're holding these batons in their hand. So eventually, there's a long story behind this whole thing that you know the madrasa was, you know, uh, the government you know was under siege by the military and you know they fought and a lot of these. Uh, girls ended up being killed by the army uh, because they refused to give up, and uh, so that's it. But uh, but it kind of stuck with me, and like you know their lives, like how you know they belong. You know, they're such at a tender age. In a, it's it's about you know they're innocent, and they are. It's there's a kind of beauty you know in the innocence, and uh, and it's almost like the ladybug. You know when I see a ladybug, it's one. It's it's a beautiful little bug. And I think there's a time of the year when you see these swarming ladybugs. You know, there's a lot of them. Uh, they come out. And 
and I've seen them, and I, you know, it's very threatening. It's like uh, infestation. So I kind of juxtapose that image uh, with the image of the the, the uh, women in the burqas, and uh, the print is called Ladybugs. Uh, and the, this is an etching. It's um, uh, it's multiple layers. Uh, there's seven different plates. So each plate is a different color. And then there's a, uh, a layer of shinkole in between. So some of the layers of the plates are printed underneath the shinkole, and then the rest are um, uh, on top to create this effect. And it's, it's very, very masterfully in, uh, uh, done. Uh, I have worked with a master printer, Peter, Peter Pettengill from Wingate Studio, uh, uh, who you know, we, was a perfectionist like, like I am, so it was a great pair. Uh, we worked on this for several months. You know, I just drive to New Hampshire you know, two hours you know, at a time and then sit there for six hours do little drawings, come back, and so back and forth. So it was, um, uh, so we created five prints. I think I've brought some here. Um, this is a detail of that print. They are almost, they are perfect in, in, in their execution and in, 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 uh, in printing. Uh, these are also like six different uh, color plates. And so I was able to pull two images out of that. And here she's seen more, you know, in the dark one, uh, you know, the bugs kind of, you know, turn, kind of uh, become the light, source of light for her. Uh, and that's the only light that she sees. And then the other one, there was an image juxtaposed of the woman holding the AK-47 in her hands. Um, and there, there she's unveiled. and. Uh, all you can see is like this uh, very kind of vulnerable sort of face, and uh, the bamboo stick is just the bamboo stick, and uh, with the woodpecker pecking on it, and in the background there is this um, uh, the hovering of these police helmets and the the turbans uh, colliding with each other. Um, going back to the mark making. Uh, I, I, I have a very diver, diverse range of works, and um, I, uh, you know, worked a lot on the figures. And then there was a time when I kind of little, uh, kind of, got a little deviated from it. To uh, this is a very large drawing. It's uh, almost about seven feet long, and uh, it's called "In God We Trust." And it's a dollar bill, and I'd made multiple dollar bills, pretty much the similar size, like six, between six feet and seven feet. And these are all done with uh, shredded money, uh, shredded dollar bills. Um, wow. <laughs> so one mark at a time. Uh, it's, you know, um, I had to get some help to finish this work. So this is one of my assistant working here with me on it. Uh, so this is the only material. This is my only, uh, you know, dollars were what I had to work with. And this kind of addresses, you know, the issue, you know, the issues are, or I'd say it addresses a little bit of the capitalism. I'm not an economist, but I have a little understanding of how what is right and what is wrong, what is real and what's not. So for me, the money is just a piece of paper. So today, if we are told to go to the shops and you can pick up anything you want, this becomes a useless thing in your pocket. So, uh, but, you know, but we have added value into a piece of paper. So um, it's, so I, you know, so what I do is, it's interesting, like how. Uh, by the way, it's uh, I did not shred this money. <laughs> it's a federal crime to cut a dollar bill. By the way, so I get it from the uh, from the, uh, the the Department of Treasury because they shred the money, their own money. So it's interesting to see how uh, this first value has been put into a piece of paper, and then its own maker devalues it by cutting it. Uh, and then I take that devalued money and I put the value back into it by making another dollar bill. <laughs> and here's a detail of it. 
Um, so I've created, I've done a $5 bill and I've done uh, the ten, $10 bill. Uh, you know, this was the first one, so I don't think we needed to show the other ones, but this was the, the first one. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this because this is an earlier piece and uh, this is from uh, 1995. Um, so uh, the use of torn text. Uh, the use of torn text in my work began when I incorporated bits of my own journals into a piece. The ritual of projecting the written version of self-preserved in the journal and pr processing it into a new form one which had to be read and interpreted in new ways, exposed the vulnerability of the written word and posed new questions and, it, and its meanings. Through this medium, I began to explore ways of transforming text to create images that can be familiar yet untranslatable. The intent of the drawings is to compel the viewer to look at the text not as a form to be read, but to be viewed and interpreted it reminds us that the reading of the written word is in fact always an interpretation. So I had been working on several different, uh, you know, exploring several different mediums, several different, uh, you know, exploring this mark making in many different ways, exploring figures in many different ways, the layering in many different ways, uh, and, uh, you know, and I brought only, believe me, I have a long history of making art, brought only, even though it seems like a lot of slides, but only few of uh, the works that I think can represent a little bit of my practice. Um, so these were the old journals and sort of like, you know, the, the, the ripping, you know, of the text is like, this is you rejecting something and, and I'm using my own writing and ripping and uh, I'm pasting it on top of it. So it's sort of like you're rejecting your own self. You're there and you're not at the same time. And if you are, you are the new, new, new you on top of it. Um, uh, and then, you know, throughout I had been working, but this was the most uh, fairly work done in the last five years uh, when I had done less work on the figures. And I wanted to also see if my work can survive without the figure. Um, uh, so this is a six foot tall drawing. And, um, it's called Call Me a Blasphemy, uh, and it was done in 2011, yes. Um, so my interest through this work um, is in exploring the effects of laws and beliefs about laws on people's lives, and the ways in which law can become a form of a religion. In recent times, some laws have become revered in the same manners as a holy scripture, with harassments, threats, and assassinations being carried out in their defense. The particular law that forms the, the jumping off point of call me a blasphemy is Pakistan's blasphemy law, which outlines the penalties for deliberately offending the religious beliefs of any person. British colonial rule introduced the law to the Indian subcontinent and it was strengthened, strengthened once um, uh, Pakistan established independence especially in, in the times of uh, uh, a military ruler. Um, uh, strict adherence to the law on the part of some has resulted in violent acts being committed against those who speak against it. So these works explore the meanings we as people assign to the text and the levels at which it can be read and understood. Uh, Call Me a Blasphemy incorporates hand-ripped pieces of documents related to the blasphemy law and to the violence it has instigated within Pakistan's borders. Uh, so here's one of the details. Um, so since I've been working in this manner, and, the, and these are really, really large scale drawings, uh, I'm not making small works, but I'm still working small. It's one mark at a time. Uh, it's just that it has multiplied. <laughs> It's like, you know, if I open up a miniature painting and if I open up with all these marks, it's gonna take up that much space anyway. So, um, uh, one in making. Okay, this is actually one of my favorite pieces. 
<laughs> uh, it took me a whole year. I worked on this, and there's only one other piece that I did, and I only produced two pieces in that year. Uh, this is called Pages of Deception. Um, they're almost six feet tall, maybe a little bit taller. Uh, two panels uh, framed side by side, sort of like an open page of a book. That, that's the format I've used. Um, I have used uh, a text from a, a particular document uh, from a very uh, a famous, a controversial terrorism trial in, in Massachusetts. So I got a hold of uh, the documents from the defense and also from uh, the prosecutor. And, uh, and while I was going through the documents, it was very interesting to, to see how uh, they both had, were accusing each other, you know, the, 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 the defendant and, and the prosecutor, they were defending, uh, accusing each of other of being a terrorist. And so it really, you know, kind of made me think what defines a terrorist, you know, what is the definition of ter ter a terrorist. Uh, it just really depends on who sees it and, and you know, and how you see it. So, so what I did was I ripped the documents. Uh, by the way, these documents are all uh, uh, it's you know publicly available, so it's not something that I was just doing. Uh, and so, ripped the documents, you know, printed them and ripped them. And and I so one of the panel is the defense, and the other is the the prosecutor. So it's called the pages of deception. Uh, so you can't really tell who's the defendant, who's the who's the the, the prosecutor. Um, the detail. If I tell you, you'll think that I'm a, you know, very torturous or something, how this was made. Each of this piece was punched. You know, the, the documents printed and then I had a, a punching machine by hand and then it was clicking these pieces, tiny little pieces out and they're like, hundreds of thousands of these pieces, and then each piece is, you, know, you see how you know, it's picked with the knife and then placed on. And that's why it took a whole year to finish it. <laughs> the detail. I thought it was very, uh, you know, this piece was also, these two pieces that I got to do in, in one year, uh, um, I thought it would be interesting to bring this and show it to you, especially in the current political uh, atmosphere. Uh, this piece was done in um, uh, 2013, yeah, uh, or 2012. Uh, this was uh, at a show at Carl's Son in Boston. Um, this is a set of 11 portraits, very, very meticulously done uh, uh, with pencil. Uh, you know, we have a different way of using pencil as miniaturists. We were taught how to draw, uh, um, you know, you sharpen your pencil until you have like the lead is all halfway through the pencil is exposed and then you, you sand it, you can make a fine tip with it. And then you hold a pencil and then you try to, uh, you know, do your mark and you have to have, uh, you know, very light pressure on your hand Otherwise, the tip will break. Uh, so that in that process, you know, we'd broken many, many tips because we did not know how to. So through this process, I learned how to hold my my pen and my pencil. So it has to be very gentle uh, to to be able. So this is how the the they've been crafted. And so what I did, uh, you know, in this work, it's actually the whole series uh, or, or um, the whole. Um, uh, show, I had titled it, um, Out Beyond the Ideas of Rightness and Wrongness, There is a Field, I'll Meet You There. And it's a verse from one of Jal the Jalaluddin Rumi's poem. And uh, so that was the title. And what I did was that, I'd, you know, looking at the old paintings, and I was always drawn to one of the Persian uh, painter, Sultan Muhammad, is like very, very fascinating. Uh, beautiful imagery of demons, like the way he paints demons, they are just exquisite and you know, ex extremely uh, seductive and beautiful. So there's this evil and yet you know, so beautiful and wonderful. And then I also uh, learned that how you know, these characters, 
uh, you know, these heroes are made in, in the tradition of miniature painting, like how, you know, you have to have a, an evil or a villain or a demon uh, for the hero to fight, fight with. You know, they are very dependent on each other. You cannot have a hero without the, the, the evil. So, uh, and it is a great reflection on, you know, how the society in general works. Um, so, you know, it's basically, it's us who define what is evil and what is good. Um, so I took, uh, you know, this as, you know, I took uh, two portraits of two different people uh, who were hailed as, both were hailed as heroes by their supporters and both were hailed as evil by, you know, the other supporters. So I took uh, the one on the, um, the right is a portrait of uh, the governor of Punjab, uh, uh, Salman Taseer, in Pakistan, and the one on uh, who was uh, killed by his own bodyguard uh, for uh, speaking against this blasphemy law that I'd been talking about uh, uh, by his own bodyguard, uh, who's a young guy, uh, uh, and when asked why you killed the the governor, and he said because he'd insulted the law that was there to protect, uh, you know, the um, uh, or the text that uh, he insulted it to that was there to protect uh, the actual blasphemy. So it was not even blasphemy, real blasphemy, it was blasphemy against the blasphemy law, and uh, so and he was hailed as a hero by some people. And, and so was Salman Taseer, you know, because, you know, you have to either give your life or take a life to be a hero. So I, I'm using these two, uh, uh, two faces just, uh, and then their faces are morphing into each other. So morphing is very particular to a moving image, you know. I know to, if, to see it in a still, you know, it's kind of distorted. So it was very challenging to make uh, something that, um, you know, it's hard to draw because it's distorted. Uh, and, 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 and then there was this, uh, I created this uh, uh, pattern in the background. Uh, it's sort of, a, it was a decal uh, of a reflective paper. So as a viewer, when you're standing in front of these portraits, you're not really looking at them because you see your own reflection. So I think uh, we as, uh, you know, a society, uh, we, we live somewhere in between these two uh, extremes, you know, between the hero and being the, the demon. It really depends on where you are, which uh, at, at, you know, in that stage of your life. So if you're in the middle, you really have a little bit of demon and a little bit of hero in you. And if you're to the right, you have a little bit. So uh, another challenging thing in terms of the process was their two faces were so extremely uh, different from each other uh, one of them was an older white guy, and uh, the other one was young, very dark-skinned, and who was wearing a cap, because that was the only picture that was available uh, all over the media uh, that, I, that I had used. Um, I'm, I'll be done soon. So <laughs> uh, this is uh, another piece, uh, you know, further exploring my mark making. From text to now, I've kind of gotten into like these three-dimensional digits that I was casting. Uh, this is a piece called I Am My Lost Diamond. This was uh, made for uh, um, this Contemporary Arts Center, uh, Cincinnati. Uh, this the, the museum that was designed by Zaha Hadid. Uh, this was a sh in a show there, uh, almost 70 feet long wall. And um, each of these pieces were casted. Uh, so I would make a mold of these uh, fingers and toes and then they're turned into tacks. So they're actually, here they're pushed into the walls. They're, they're like pins, and they're pushed into the walls. So it actually took several days to install the piece. Uh, um, so that also, you know, it's a very disturbing, you know, content-wise, it's not uh, easy, you know, you can't easily digest the content of it, but I wanted it to look very beautiful. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's sort of like, you know, the piece is, a, you know, it's like about bringing your own attention to your own body, like how uh, fragile a body is, and we 
never ever think about it, like how uh, much we take it for granted. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, every morning you wake up to go out of the house and you open your door with your doorknob and you close it with a doorknob and you never really think about the doorknob that's there and you use it every day. So it's sort of like, you know, like your little fingers, toes, like a little toenail. We would never even think about it separately from us and how painful it can be if it's taken from us. So what triggered this piece was not very pretty. Uh, since I've moved, you know, uh, to the, you know, I'd seen the rise in violence. There was a lot of uh, suicide attacks in, in Pakistan, you know, and uh, killed a lot of lots and lots of people, especially since September 11th. And, um, and you know, just whenever this happens, and especially in the city that I grew up, you know, you're always like alarmed, okay, because you're thinking about your family members, your friends, and then you pick up the phone and say, is everybody okay? We just heard this in the news. And, and you'll say, you know, the same thing happened one time, you know, it heard it was a big blast in an area where I remember growing up, going there a lot, you know, it was very, there were uh, some very famous shops there we used to shop. And I called a friend and uh, asked her, and she said, oh, you will not believe it, I just missed it by 10 minutes. So it sort of it was very surreal, and she, when she said it to me, and she said, you know, I have these morbid images of me being in that place if I had gotten there 10 minutes ago, in different pieces, and it really made me think about like how much we take our own body for for granted. And uh, so, you know, I was already exploring these, uh, casting a lot of these fingers in my studio. I didn't bring the slides; I should have. Um, uh, but then it turned into this piece. Um, and then this is "I Am My Lost Diamond." So, uh, and then there's another one that I did uh, was uh, for the Tufts University Art Gallery for their show. This was a rug that I'd created. Uh, there it is. So these are all uh, casted in, uh, I, you know, um, uh, with resin. And uh, so I add pigment in the resin when I'm mixing it before I pour it into the mold. And, um, then my last project uh, was at uh, uh, commissioned by the State Department for the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, and um, and I uh, these are you know casted little pieces that um, um, they you know I have drawn these first, and then you know we uh, cut those pieces out in wood or plastic, and then I made molds of these, and then uh, they've turned into pattern. I'll talk about it in a minute, and. I'm gonna um, just say a little few words about this. This is just not the actual work, but this is the preparation of the work. So this work is inspired by my recent investigation in the traditions of classical Arabic language and its use in visual format, the meditative process of repetitive recitation of the selective classical text from the Quran, also knows, known as dhikr or dhikr, and its physical manifestations through stylized mark making in the form of calligraphy became some of the points of origin for this work. Uh, so this was the commission, and um, and I, I found it, you know, I'd been doing this for like several years now. I've been trying to learn uh, a new language uh, because I, we grew up, I grew up in Pakistan, and this, the spoken language there is Urdu. Uh, we use the same script as the Arabic, but the language is different. And as growing up as a Muslim, you're, you know, we learn how to read Quran. So all of us, you know, we can read Quran, but none of us can understand it. We are really dependent on on the translation of it, you know, by somebody else. Uh, so this was one of the, you know, I, I think I was in one of uh, uh, at a museum for a talk, and we were talking about these, and and then I was listening to my own talk, and I realized I think, you know, it's important you need to have an access to the text. So I started learning, and the more I learned, it was just like found it, you know, how uh, the meditation of recitation, how similar, you know, it didn't seem anything new because I was already used to it, doing this meditation through physical, and this was more vocal. And, uh, um, um, you know, so I learned all about the, the science of phonetics, and, um, and, you know, with the small little change of the dot, and how the meanings can can be changed. Um, 
So this was very fascinating. And uh, so what I did was for, for that uh, space uh, in, in the embassy, it's a huge, huge compound, uh, the, the new embassy that they had built in Islamabad. Uh, it's a sort of like a city in itself. And um, um, there's very limited access. You have to go through a lot of security you know, if you, uh, to get in there. Not everybody can, only if you're going for visas or you're, if you're a US citizen, you can get in there. So I had to create something for the space in which I thought, you know, it's right in that space, but it's so also kind of detached from the local culture. So I have to do something to bring something that is out there inside the space so that people who are, this, this space was basically for the, the, the employees or the people who are working in the business because it's very hard for them also to leave the, it's not a very easy job there if you go work for the State Department, you go back to uh, uh, to work for the the embassy. You literally trapped all day in there, and uh, so so um, so I kind of drove around the city and I collected my references. I came back, I put things together. Uh, so there's a reference to obviously calligraphy, which which is, which is what we were used to. I was we would see this Arabic as a visual image rather than, you know, having, like, can you be able to read and understand it? So, so I thought, you know, I could, you know, these are, I could use this as, as, as different marks and create the, some specific patterns that are very particular to that, uh, that uh, local culture. So I looked into some Multani tiles and uh, some Kashikari patterns that um, uh, this whole is based on. And, uh, and then, so, it's a lot of molding and casting, and it cast a lot of uh, the small pieces, and then the ones that you just saw in the earlier slide, in the earlier slide, and then then each piece is kind of placed like a, a, a ripped text. It's glued on the panel, and that's how the the pattern is created. So from a distance, it looked like a pattern. When you come close, you see all these letters. So it's all built with alphabets. Uh, here's me installing the show. to give you the, the idea of this, how big it is. So it's almost 80 feet long, uh, and it spreads to two different walls. Uh, uh, it has a little break in, in between. Uh, there's a big door. So, so I created a little a, a different piece for the shorter wall, which was 20, 20 feet. And Everything here is made in my studio. I barely outsource anything. Everything was made by me and my assistants. And uh, we, I, starting from the scratch, from the making of the panels, to the drawing, to the small pieces and the molds and the casting, and then the actual piece. So if you ever go to Pakistan as a U.S. citizen, you're you're allowed. You just have to give them their passport and then let you in, and you can actually see the piece. Uh, especially the uh, the Pakistani American friends here. So. So uh, this is the last piece, uh, and that's the uh, the print uh, that uh, you know I worked on uh, uh, for the museum. Um, uh, this is a silk screen print, and it's uh, nine uh, different screens. The image is created, and this was happening at the same time I was uh, finishing the project. So it's kind of connected to uh, to the installation works. Uh, but there's an, a little addition to the piece is that it's also juxtaposed with the, the image of this female has come back into the work now, but in a very different manner. Um, so it sort of like looks like a silhouette. I wish I had uh, the um, detail, but you know if you have the original print available, you'll get to see that. Uh, it's also the, the 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 figure is also crafted uh, with small dots and lines, so it's really not like a really crafted figure. Uh, um, 
So the figurative imagery juxtaposed on the stylized surface is linked with my previous work. It is a female figure projected in multiple silhouettes that are seen engaged in a self-destructive ritual with a leash in her hand. One of the figure is riding on, on the back of the other as if to gain control while aiming to pick and destroy the third at the tip of her of a sword. In this apparently violent and brutal narrative, she seems to have conquered the art of balancing. It is a metaphor that there is no way of growth without having to go through destruction of the self. So I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. I think I took longer time than <laughs> I was assigned. <laughs> oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. Let's thank uh, Ambreen Budd again for her <laughs> wonderful presentation. Um, can you take one or two questions? Sure. Um, uh, I know uh, it's a wonderful fall day, but if anyone has questions, we probably have time for one or two. I did. The question was, how was her work received in Pakistan? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, as soon as I installed it, I just left. <laughs> I didn't get to. Uh, yes, by the. I don't know about the art uh, community there because I didn't get to while I was installing. I didn't get to be engaged with them. But uh, the locals, uh, they. Uh, I, you know, it was wonderful. I wish I had brought the slides. There were some slides like. You know, people who were, would get to live with the work, who go there every day, and they are Pakistanis, they are Americans uh, also, you know, who come from America go there. Uh, they equally, uh, I think it created a lot of buzz there because the space was so dull and boring and huge, uh, and it all, all in, in almost kind of uh, brought life uh, in that space, so, you know, closeness. So, and I heard, you know, I got an email from someone there and said, oh, you know, uh, people are making um, an effort to go through this, uh, um, the ballroom to go to their offices so that they could see your work. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, some of them works, uh, you know, certainly, you know, because of the content, you know, I know, you know, it's not easy to see it because it's easy to interpret in them in, in, a, in a different direction. And really, I, I don't control that. I can't control it. I can only control the work as long as it's in my studio. And once it's out, you know, whoever's going to take it is going to take it. Once the word is out of my mouth, I can't take it back. So I just have to live with the consequences. If it offends someone, I'm sorry. But if it, you know, pleases someone, great. Any more questions? As an artist, I appreciate that you you did it again and again. You you were immersed, you were engaged, so all the stitching, all the dots, there was a, all the time that goes in there. That won't be appreciated by anybody but the artist. But the fact that you did it and you told us about it is important because that's who you are. I mean, there's so so many different different disciplines. Thank you. Th thank you. I didn't. Oh, I can say it. thank you. <laughs> yes. How do you um, think of my mother's work? I, I'm going to give you my tip for free. <laughs> um, so, um, so what I, I cover the surface with a very thin layer of uh, acrylic, some sort of an acrylic. Uh, and that would hold the mylar, uh, that would hold uh, the watercolor. So when I, you know, in miniature painting, we are trained to use watercolor on a layer of white gouache because the watercolors directly on the paper, it's a different technique without the white gouache. So white gouache is like a primer, you know, for instance, like gesso, you know, but it's gouache, it's water soluble. So 
when you're making your mark, you want to make sure that you're not lifting the white off the surface. You have to have the water, your uh, uh, co color resting on that white, uh, um, uh, white surface of the paint, white gouache. Uh, and that's the way you are able to achieve the luminosity in the color. If the color is blended with white, you will lose the luminosity. So it's a similar technique, but I used acrylic surface because acrylic will stick to anything and won't come off, but especially when it's a thin, thin, very sort of like a, a diluted layer of, you know, it will, you know, it will not come off from, um, but it give, gives enough body for the watercolor to sit on it. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you again. Be sure to spend some time with the print.